on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Mind. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Fascinating topic tonight on Open Line. We are talking about a push to reverse history and restore large sections of open grassland in Tennessee. And, and, and it, this is being led by the Southeastern Grassland Initiative. So it's a fascinating kind of look at this, at this new effort to, to bring back grassland in our state and really all across the Southeast. So we have two people with us who can help discuss this and, and, and educate us on it. We have the Executive Director of the Southeastern Grassland Initiative, Dwayne Estes. Dwayne, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for having us, Ben. And Theo Witzel, co-founder and chief ecologist of the Southeastern Grassland Initiative. And uh, thank you, Theo. Dwayne, I saw you. you in a story that was on News Channel 5. It was done by Chris Davis, and you were beginning to talk about this. But when mm -hmm. I open the show and I say an effort to reverse history and restore large tracts of, of open grassland, what, what, what does that mean, reverse history? Well, Ben, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm a Middle Tennessean born and raised. I grew up in Giles County, about an hour south of Nashville. And in 1990, when I was in the sixth grade, I had a history teacher uh, in a class called Tennessee History who told us this very fanciful story about how the first, when the first Europeans got to the shores of Eastern North America, how they encountered these vast impenetrable forests that basically covered everything from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. And I remember him telling the story about how this proverbial squirrel could travel through the treetops all the way across that vast distance without ever touching the ground. And the logic being that the entire Eastern, Eastern United States was covered in, in dense forest. And really it was, um, I think until I became a PhD student at the University of Tennessee and, and later a professor here at Austin Peay State University, I really began to reconcile that with the facts and with historical information and with scientific and ecological information. And that just does not square with uh, what we now know to be true. And so we're trying to go back and really begin to investigate those early historical references from early Nashville settlement history and pair that up with data from biology. And what it's really revealing, Ben, is a fascinating and untold story. And in fact, what we call it is a untold story of American history and conservation. It really has not been told on a, on a stage that, and we're trying to tell that story for the first time. I love it, that's fascinating. So it's kind of this, you're right, I think we have all thought that there was super dense forest and that's that's the way it used to be, but you're saying there's this other side of it. And Theo, I'll, I, I, w I would ask, I guess, that you define, when we start talking about, we know it's not dense forest, but what is grassland? A farm field, would that, would that count? I mean, that's certainly open. What, when we're talking about restoring uh, grassland, what, what exactly is that? Yeah, I think we need to sort of step back in time, really, and think about, I mean, yes, in a sense, an open field dominated by grass is a grassland, but the, the original sort of native grasslands that we're interested in were the product of great antiquity, right? These were um, communities that had sorted themselves out over thousands of years, and they are very complex ecologically. There's a lot of different species of plants and animals and sort of have interrelationships within those grasslands. And they, they range from everything from open tall grass prairies, which were fairly common in parts of the Southeast 300, 200 years ago, um, to open savannas and woodlands. So ecosystems with trees in them, but the trees are not densely packed together like we see today with the canopies touching, but scattered out, uh, light coming in, and hundreds and hundreds of species uh, of plants and animals on the ground, uh, especially plants, are really rich uh, diversities of sun-loving uh, flora on the ground. And of course, these rich um, floristic communities provide nectar for um, uh, all kinds of different insects and vertebrates, which in turn are food for all sorts of other wildlife. So very rich uh, wildlife communities historically in these open grasslands and many different types. And I think we'll talk about the different types of grasslands uh, that occurred in central Tennessee, but also kind of throughout the Southeast as we go through the discussion tonight. Absolutely. And and I also want to hit on, you know, what's at stake? What, what, 
what habit, I guess, what animals are we talking about? Let's say we can reestablish some of this. Who or what lives there, Dwayne? What about that? Well, that's a great question. You know, we lost bison, which uh, were in the Nashville area up until about the 1790s. You know, we lost that, those species primarily due to overhunting. Uh, other species that we lost up until about 1812 was greater prairie chicken. But what we're seeing today, Ben, is here in the mid to late 20th century and 21st century, that we're still now seeing a second wave of loss. And um, it is now a slender glass lizard. It is a uh, northern harrier, a type of hawk. It's the short-eared owl. It's Henslow sparrow. It's many different species of butterflies and moths, uh, bumblebees. And what a we're white seeing, quail. Bob white quail is the big one right here in Middle Tennessee. I mean, I remember kicking up numerous, I mean, many cubbies of quail in Giles County back in the early and mid 90s. But, um, you know, today you can hardly find quail anywhere. And that's also symptomatic of the loss of these open landscapes. And what we're now seeing is a widespread collapse, whether you're in Florida or East Texas, Central North Carolina or Western Kentucky, the story is the same uh, across the Southeast. We're, um, the biggest collapses in biodiversity right now are not happening in uh, forested ecosystems. They're happening in ecosystems that should be naturally open, like grasslands and woodlands. And so how do you go about making this shift? You know, uh, returning us to this, this way we used to be, how, how does that happen? And Theo, I mean, kind of what's the strategy? Where, where are you? I mean, have you, have you restored a bunch? Or are you just starting? And, and kind of what's the plan? I would say really we're just starting, but there's different types of restoration tactics and each site maybe has a different prescription on what it needs. So in some cases, some types of prairies, for example, the Penny Royal Plain, which uh, was that area around Clarksville, Fort Campbell, going up into Kentucky, had about 3 million acres of treeless prairie 250 years ago. But today it's almost all been destroyed, converted to other uses, agriculture, um, paved over for towns. In those cases, it's really almost a recreation that we have to do. We have to gather seed from the few precious little remnant prairies. And these remnants are really worth talking about and giving a little attention to. These are areas that um, were never destroyed and they're very hard to come by at this time, at this point in time. But they have the biodiversity, the different species and so on that they're hanging on only on those remnants and they're the, the few little scraps of ancient prairie that are left. That is the seed source for any restoration that we want to happen. In many cases, the species of plants that uh, are found there are not found in any other habitat. So these are areas that we can go into and harvest seed from to then plant prairie back. And we've done that at several sites up around the Clarksville area. We have a, a 50 acre prairie that we've planted from uh, genetically um, appropriate material from that region, plant species uh, on the on Google's campus there uh, at Clarksville. We have uh, a project on the at a welcome center um, of the Tennessee Department of Transportation there and also one in um, at uh, State Park uh, there in, in Clarksville. So we have a number of projects that we've done that way. There are other areas where it's not that the, the grasslands were plowed up, it's that they were allowed to grow up in trees over time. So fire was a major component that helped maintain grasslands in an open condition and a healthy, vibrant condition in the southeastern United States. Where we have enough rainfall, you would expect forest everywhere, but there in fact wasn't forest everywhere. And fire was an ecosystem process that was important in keeping it open. And so without fire for the last 150 years or 100 years in some places, We've seen this densification of those open savannas and woodlands that I was talking about before. And in those sorts of areas, we can go in and thin out some of the trees, get light back into the ground, reintroduce fire to sort of remove the decades of, of dead leaf material and so on that's like a blanket on the ground today and encourage that rich diversity of ground loving or ground flora, sun loving ground flora um, to come back. And in some cases, there's a persistent seed bank in these sites or what we call a rootstock bank, which are individual sun-loving plants that are still alive, but just barely in the dense shade of these woods where they might have a few leaves hanging on, but they never flower. They never make fruit or seed um, because they don't have enough light and we can bring the light back. That's the main thing. We can reopen these communities for business is one sort of way to, to talk about it. 
put groceries on the ground from a wildlife standpoint, uh, food, food and, and uh, covered resources for these wildlife. And that's another way to restore. So in some cases it's a, a, a sort of a recreation from scratch almost. Uh, and in other cases, it's working with what's on a site and encouraging um, the grassland flora and fauna and then sort of suppressing, in some cases, the woody vegetation or other non-native invasive plants that are uh, causing things to be out of balance. Suppressing non-native invasive plants. In the, in the story that um, Chris Davis and, and photojournalist Mike Rose did, uh, Dwayne, I believe you walked up to this big fat tree that was very old, right? Like you said, maybe 200 years old. And all around it, there were these other, you know, pretty trees. But but you said this tree was original and all this other has just kind of grown up. That, that your theory, I believe, I guess I'll let you say it, it, this would have been an open field back in the day, but but somehow all this stuff has just grown up, right? I mean, there used to be like one big tree and... I guess describe describe that moment when, when you found the big 200 year old tree and then all the other stuff around it. Well, yeah, and, and even going back, I guess, being a little bit beyond that is you're asking a, a great question, which is how do we know, right? How do we inform what we do today on the ground with conservation? Ideally, our organization believes that we should use history as our sort of guideline for what to do today. So, you know, we firmly believe that there are many areas of Tennessee that naturally should be forested. And we would never advocate ever that a naturally forested ecosystem should be thinned or clear cut or, or whatever. Let's let forests be where forests should be. And there's an ecological definition we subscribe to. But where we have the factual historical and scientific evidence that suggests otherwise, that these were savannas or these were uh, meadows or prairie communities, uh, we need to really trust in that. And I think that's one of the things about our organization that we value is that we're firmly based in American history and firmly based in, um, in science. So back to your question, how do we go out and, and spot a big tree in the middle of a forest and sort of diagnose what's happening? In many ways, it's um, it's imagine for example that you ask a um you know um a medical uh forensic pathologist to come out and, and look at a site or you know look at a crime scene right and they would be able to sort of begin to recreate the events of what have happened based on certain clues what we do is we use basically landscape forensics we walk into a forest and we can tell you if that forest was an open field 50 years ago uh, we can tell you if it was a savanna 190 years ago. And there's all kinds of ways in which we do that. So we basically look look at a site and evaluate it through a forensic lens. So when I walk into that scene, I see just a, a couple of big scattered trees. And when you Open look at them, you see their branches are, are really spread out. And that tells you that they had to have grown once in an open setting. But But also then you look and see what else is growing around it. And when you begin to see a hackberry tree and thickets of red cedar, and you see all these other species which are a little bit weedier and have, uh, they, they must grow up and germinate and grow in uh, high light conditions like you find in an old field. Then the story begins to sort of um, reveal itself of, of what that change has looked like over a multi-decade period. And I'll ask both of you this. There has been some controversy, right? I mean, the, in, in, in the report that they did, they were talking about the TWRA situation um, on the Bridgestone Wildlife Management Area out in White County. So there is some yes. controversy, right? That's a situation where there are 200 acres. I think there are trees there. And you're saying, well, you know, I, it, it would, this area would benefit from not having the trees and being this open grassland. You know, how... how what do you say to people that are concerned by that? You know, you're talking about removing trees, making it grassland. What, what about that aspect of it? And either one of you can take this. That's a great question. And we certainly understand. I mean, you know, I think both of us probably in our history as ecologists first fell in love with uh, botany and plants because we love forest. Um, I know growing up in the hills of southern middle Tennessee, I. I, I was much uh, more in love with forests in my you know early half of my life than, than I was about grasslands because I didn't know of, of their existence. I think in this case of Bridgestone, what we have to look at is there are parts of the Bridgestone property that are 100% naturally forested landscapes. They've been forest for 
hundreds of years, you know, thousands of years. Now, sure, they've been logged in the 1800s and probably early 1900s, and they're recovering. But we still believe firmly, especially down on the slopes and in the gorges over around the Virgin Falls wilderness, those should stay intact forest, right? And the historical data supports that too, that they've always been forced. More importantly, the species that grow in those and live in those situations, the birds, the mammals, uh, the wildflowers, all uh, testify to the fact that they need high shade and, and uh, they need moist conditions that only a forest can provide. We're all in total agreement. Let's leave those areas perfectly intact and never cut those if we can. But when you get up on the top of the Cumberland Plateau, that's where the story begins to become more complicated. Uh, we know from historical records that, this, that the top of the plateau, which is very dry and has sandstone near the surface, uh, had a very uh, a vibrant fire regime that would burn every one to two or three years, a couple hundred years ago. That was enough to keep the surface of the Cumberland Plateau very open. And we go back to the descriptions from, you know, 1797 or 1874, which again and again testify to the fact that the surface of the plateau um, was definitely a much more open savanna landscape, open grassy woodlands, and in many areas with open prairie-like landscapes. Um, so first of all, again, we're guided by the historical data. And I think, um, now you have to keep in mind, these areas may be separated physically by just a, couple, a few tenths of miles, right? So location matters. And in this specific location that the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency has chosen, all of the available evidence, uh, and I think you could ask many different conservation organizations and scientists about this, that the available evidence suggests that that particular tract is best suited to being a shortleaf pine oak savanna, not a closed canopy forest. Now, there may be some debate about how we get back to that savanna, um, but I think the science and the historical data are very clear that it, in, in fact, should be a savanna landscape. And you do that. The, oh, go ahead. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say one of the main uh, things that we look at, uh, we look for botanical clues in the landscape. Mm -hmm. The surface of the Cumberland Plateau, we've known for years, as botanists being up there looking around, that the, the power line corridors, the big sort of transmission line rights of way, are just loaded with grassland species, rare things that are really rare today. It's the only place you'll see them on the surface of the plateau. Uh, but you can find all these rare plants that need prairie habitat within these power line corridors, occasionally on a broad roadside that's maybe mowed once a year or something like that. But uh, you know, th th these are species that don't just show up uh, in an open, they're not in just an open field or a clear cut or something. They're in these areas that have been maintained in an open condition for a long time. And we see those as clues of a grassland heritage to that site. And it's not that there were no trees on the surface of the Cumberland Plateau. It's just that they were much, and there were areas of open prairie, but they were likely small, but surrounded by these open savannas and woodlands with its trees widely scattered and so on enough that that grassland flora was able to persist over the long term and uh, and those are the things that sort of clue us in that this is a site where it might be appropriate to do some savanna restoration versus those forest sites down uh, on the escarpment of the slope uh, going down into the gorges off the surface of the plateau and then i would just add to that, that it's not about not wanting trees to be there but the important fact is we want the right trees to be there instead of having scarlet oak and red maple and black gum and sourwood, the right trees would be shortleaf pine, post oak, black jack oak, white oak. Um, and again, there's there's an ample data that support that. Well, yeah, and I was, I was gonna go to a break, but I wanna ask one more thing before we go to break. And, and it's right along that. I mean, are you concerned? We did, we grew up hearing about the decline of, you know, forests, you know, the decline of old growth forests. And, and we were all worried about that. And that was where conservation was really kind of focused. Are you concerned about competing with forests for what you're talking about now, this open grassland savanna thing. How, how, how do you deal with that? Is it a concern that you're competing with that? Is there room for both? You know, what, what about that concern? And Dwayne, why don't you take that? I, I think we should be concerned with um, why it's important to recognize these sites to begin with as being uh, extremely important. And that is the biodiversity that they sustain is, you know, uh, 
that they could sustain as being a savannah is probably four to five times greater than what they currently can sustain or are sustaining. And so I think we can achieve a good happy medium by, again, with savannas, if they should be there and if the data support, they should be there. We should be able to, to, I think, make both camps happy, right? We can have the grassland flora, the wildflowers and grasses on the ground, but we still need to keep a certain amount of tree cover above ground. Again, it's the right trees, right? So um, I think we can strike the right balance with savannas up on the Cumberland Plateau in that particular case. And the last thing I would say is we certainly don't want to compete with old growth forest. We believe those two are almost mutually exclusive, right? If you go right. into Fall Creek Falls State Park down in the canyons, that's where the old growth forests are. But up on the surface of the plateau, what we would in fact expect to see, we should see, uh, is old growth grassland in the form of an old growth savanna. I think we should begin to embrace that concept. And, and old growth grasslands is something that um, most people are just are, are not familiar with. Fascinating. Theo, do you want to add something really quickly before we go to break? I think he summed it up really well. That's Thanks really time. interesting. All right, we will take a break. And there is the phone number. If you want to call in a question or comment, very interesting discussion. There's the number, 615-737-PLUS. Phone lines are open, 615-737-7587. We'll take a break. Be back right after this.